one of the interesting things that I always think is like, everybody has some kind of imposter syndrome. I don't know that you can get to this without going through it. But like, I think I really overestimated the breadth of knowledge of my clients. Podcast Junkies, episode 301. We have crossed into the four century mark. Thank you so much for following along this journey. If you're a brand new listener and you just discovered this show, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Harry Duran. I'm the host. And this is the one where we speak to some of the most interesting voices in podcasting, as far as I'm concerned. And we get them to kick back their heels, talk about their shows and whatever else is on their mind. In case you missed the last episode, I launched it and published it on the week I was in podcast movement in Dallas. So a little bit more on that in a sec. But that episode was with longtime friend of the show, Chris Curran. He's the founder and lead instructor of Podcast Engineering School, teaching folks how to produce podcasts at the highest professional level. He also hosts the Podcast Engineering Show and the Mystic Show. We had an amazing conversation about all things, surprise, surprise, to no one, (laughs) spirituality, overcoming limiting beliefs, and his expertise in the audio and recording industry. I couldn't be more honored to have had him as my 300 guests, and I think you'll really enjoy the episode if you haven't listened to it already. This week, back to more of my podcasting peeps, and speaking of no other than Jeremy Enns, he's the founder of Podcast Marketing Academy. He helps scrappy brands and creators hit their podcast growth milestones with a step-by-step playbook and through his extensive experience in audio. He definitely understands that podcasting is one of the best ways to consistently generate leads, make sales, and elevate your profile. In this episode, we're discussing his passion for writing and creating content and what separates a consistent show with a growing successful one and the value of pursuing a niche and narrow audience. Bonus, I got to actually meet Jeremy in person, Podcast Movement, one of the names I had on my list of podcast host bingo (laughs) and it's a great opportunity not only to see friends that i've known for such a long time 2014 my first podcast movement but new friends that i'm connecting through via facebook and specifically twitter when it comes to jeremy who's really got his podcast twitter game on lock so make sure you'll check him out i'll give you more details about that later so much i want to cover so many things that have been on my mind lately like i said had a blast in dallas and then i was back for a few days and then headed out to a much needed vacation with some friends in mexico and uh surprisingly it was the first time i'd ever been at an all-inclusive resort i can't believe i don't think they they were ever on my radar and i just probably poo-pooed them as a, a place where i wouldn't have a good time i was proved wrong most definitely had a blast really relaxed and it was really fun to come back then i've just been up north in minnesota for a couple days at the cabin celebrating labor day weekend and now uh, i'm actually have another short week (laughs) and we'll be meeting up with some friends and catching a show in vegas of all things we decided to just uh pick a nate bargati show we're both comedy fans my partner and i and we're going to be doing that so that's going to be fun and some other shenanigans I'm sure we'll get into. So crazy, crazy travel. Been in three different locations in the past three weeks. But uh, it's going to be nice to have a full week of rest when I'm back. Uh, rest and work. And uh, yeah, it was just a nice experience. I think that what I took away from podcast movement was just to consistently go deep with the relationships that I have in the space. And then through new ones I'm making that have either seen me speak or know of the show, then just go deeper um, with the ones that are really resonating for me. Speaking of the talk, in case you missed it or had not heard, I gave a talk that I've been honing for uh, a couple of conferences. It's how I've generated now over 60K in revenue with the Vertical Farming Podcast. So if that's something of interest to you, you can at least catch the slides. I don't remember if Podcast Movement is allowing... uh, replays to be viewed by anyone or people who have bought specifically a virtual pass highly worth it to do it if you haven't done so already to get the virtual pass if you missed the conference you'll be able to see my talk which was uh, on thursday at 2 p.m but if you wanted to at least see the slides that i covered i created a special page for that go to fullcast.co that's f-u-l-l-c-a-s-t dot c-o forward slash p-m 22 and you'll get a copy of those and you can follow up with me if there's any questions 
Remember, if you're enjoying this podcast, this episode, past episodes, I would love it if you leave a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash podcast junkies. Oh man, I forgot to mention <laughs> at Podcast Movement, I got to, to take a picture and see speak Adam Curry, he of uh, MTV VJ fame. And obviously as a child of the 80s, that was a special moment for me. And uh, he was nice enough uh, to agree to come on the show, which is so exciting. If you'll remember, uh, we had Dave Jones on of, of Podcasting 2.0, and I was so happy to see them both speak and get to shake Dave Jones' hand in person. So it's one of the, the special things that really happen at these podcasting conversations, and I just can't uh, get enough of reminding you <laughs> why they're so important to me. In line with that, and it would be remiss if I didn't mention it specifically after talking about Adam Curry, if you want to learn more about what's happening in the space, first thing I'd point you to is the Podcasting 2.0 podcast. Dave and Adam have a weekly board meeting where they discuss the ins and outs. If you can watch their talk, they watch their talk at Podcast Movement. If you're seeing the replay, they give a great overview of Podcasting 2.0 there. Head on over to podcastindex.org to learn more and specifically to start learning about apps. Play around with some of these apps. I'm trying out Podverse this week, actually, because I was browsing and I wanted to listen to a show while I was browsing as opposed to listening in off my phone since I had the headphones on already. And Podverse does a great job of letting you create a player from your browser, but specifically they've got the new podcasting 2.0 features in there. And I can, I'm eventually going to set up my wallet so I can send boostergrams to Adam and Dave and any, any of the other shows that have value for value enabled. So if a lot of that jargon does not make sense for you, get involved, learn a little bit more each day, newpodcastapps.com, at least from the listener side to see what the experience is like. On the mobile side, Fountain is one of my favorite apps in this space, and I'm now trying out Podverse on the browser. So I really encourage you to at least kick the tires a little bit. Okay, just a quick word from our sponsor, and then we'll get into this interview with Jeremy. And don't forget to listen to the end of the episode. I'm working on a special project together with him, and I'll give you the details after our interview. So stay tuned till the end. I'm grateful for the opportunity to partner with Focusrite. I'm so excited to talk about their newest line of sound cards, the Vocaster. It's got an endless list of features. I'll go through a couple here. Auto gain, easily set your levels with the click of a button. With more than enough gain on tap, 70 dB, no booster needed. An enhanced feature, which allows four podcaster-approved voice presets, which will bring out the best in any voice. You can silence the mic with the touch of a mute button and record phone calls, high quality music, or any audio from your device seamlessly. You can record to a camera directly to its memory card. It's got a loopback feature to stream calls or any other audio you can think of from your computer. And three amazing packages of software, Hindenburg Lite, three months of Squadcast Pro plus video, and six months of Acast Influencer. What an amazing package. You can learn more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash vocaster. All right, Jeremy Enns, founder at Podcaster Marketing Academy. Or podcasting marketing, podcast marketing academy, podcast marketing academy. So we're going to leave all that in just to so you can hear me butcher it. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for uh, joining me on Podcast Junkies. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Harry. So we we're just quickly chatting how we're sort of in the same podcast social circles, and uh, I think I was just trying to figure out like if we've talked or if we've had chats in, at the. Have we ever run into each other at a conference? I don't think so. I think we, mainly it's been through like LinkedIn or Twitter yeah. or probably Facebook back in the day. I haven't logged into Facebook for, I don't know, over a year. But yeah, I feel like probably we did back then at some point as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's home for you? Just to kind of set the stage here. So I'm from Canada, lived in Vancouver for seven years. But the past six years, I've actually been doing the nomadic travel thing full time. So I'm currently in Winnipeg, Canada, visiting friends and family. But we're my partner and I, we talked with an immigration lawyer last Friday about potentially starting the process to move to Portugal. So wow. that's kind of in the works. We've, uh, yeah, kind of, it's been a good six years of traveling, but we've reached a point where we're really looking forward to having a home base. So by the next time anybody chats with me, potentially that will be the home base, Lisbon, Portugal. Is your partner from Portugal? No, she's from uh, Dallas and lived in New York for 10 years. Okay. And so part of this all is like we, neither of us can live full time in the other person's country. And so <laughs> let's move to either Canada, the US, or we thought, well, if, if one of us has to get citizenship and residency somewhere, maybe we can pick somewhere else that we'd rather be more than either of those options. How did uh, Portugal make the shortlist? So 
the, I guess we've been there before. We really do like it, but it also has the easiest kind of residency process of most of Europe. And so interesting. We were looking at Berlin first, and we were actually there earlier this year. But then she ended up taking a full-time job, which kind of didn't work with the visa requirements for a German visa. So that's the longer term, maybe five-year plan is to, to maybe end up there at some point. Okay. I've been to Berlin. I like it a lot. And it's got very... I mean, everything's got an international flavor when you're coming from like North America, yeah. but, <laughs> but there is just some sort of like a cultural mix of stuff going on there that I found really interesting and... I wanted to go, I have a background in like house music and DJing. And so I went to go Berlin's to the, the spot. Yeah. The Mecca of like techno went to Berghain. So it was just like a really fun experience. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that kind of draws us there. There's like a tech scene, super like creative artsy scene. Now I got introduced some, like the podcasting scene is taking off, I think. So yeah, lots of good stuff. Go there, stake your claim in the podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> using all the, all the stuff you learned here in, <laughs> in the States and North America. Yeah. How much uh, are you tracking what's happening in other countries in terms of like awareness and, ex you know, and acceptance of like the podcasting space? Not so much. I mean, I have conversations with people every now and again. I feel like I have a lot of people. I don't necessarily know how this happens. I assume there's something just because I've been traveling a lot. There's I don't really even advertise that, but I feel like I have a pretty diverse audience from all over the world. And so I don't quite know why that's happened. But I know I have a lot of people in the UK, which it seems like that podcasting scene is, is really taking off. Um, and being from Canada, I know there's a number of Canadians who, who follow me and who I interact with. And that's kind of catching up as well. And I think I read some stat recently that per capita, more Canadians actually listen to podcasts than Americans do now. And then like, strangely enough, I've been seeing a lot of people with French domain addresses sign up to my email list recently. And have at least a couple students and some community members who are from France. So it seems like that, the podcasting scene there is kind of taking off as well. So in looking through the, some of the stuff that you had on, on LinkedIn, you definitely have a passion for audio. And you have also have a passion for photography. Which one of those goes back further? They kind of like have intertwined. And like one's taken the lead and the other will take the back seat. So okay. I would say audio goes back further okay audio definitely goes back further from like a music perspective and so i played in like metal and hardcore bands in high school and after played guitar and what was the band's name so we the uh the band that uh it's stupid name that my drummer picked is sally field like the actress <laughs> Never understood where it came from. I protested in the moment. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and I was like, what? And I think it was some kind of like hipster, you know, name. And it, I was like, okay, well, whatever. Clearly, the, we, him and I had the, <laughs> there was the power dynamic you always hear about in the bands. There's like two people who always butt heads. It was him and I. Okay. And uh, I was just kind of like, okay, well, I guess you're going to win this one because everyone else thought it was hilarious. And I was like, this is kind of stupid. But <laughs> that was the name. But her actual name is uh, Fields with an S, right? It might be because everybody always pronounces that when they always say that when my like friends at, from the time from like high school will always say like oh yeah sally fields the band i was like well that wasn't the name but i don't know so yeah, yeah a music goes back further and then i got into actually then i got into went to audio school so got into the the engineering side of things and uh kind of a record production and then kind of photography came into the scene after that and kind of i after the I entered at a, at a big recording studio in Vancouver and at some point realized like I don't have what it takes or don't want to make the sacrifices necessary to make it in that field where there's you know you kind of go into the studio at 8 a.m. when you're the intern you leave at 4 a.m. when the sessions wrap up for the day I was doing that one day a week and some people were doing that every day of the week and I was like I will literally die if I do that <laughs> and so I'm going to do something else and then kind of photography came in I did a shot a couple of weddings, did portrait stuff, and then kind of came back into podcasting as a listener and then quickly realized all the, the audio skills kind of transferred over to that. Was the pursuit of audio, the audio engineering that came out of like your time in the bands and just wanted to just kind of learn how to do better and create better sound? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, I would make a much different decision at the time now, but being, I don't know, 20, 21 or something like that, you know, you just hear the cultural assumption is that you can't make it as like an artist, right? Or as a musician. And so I was like, oh, this is an actual job. Like there's a an audio <laughs> engineer, that's a real job path. And then you get into yeah. that and you realize it's basically the same thing as make, making it as an artist is you're going to be freelance. You're going to need to like, you know, find all your own gigs. It's going to be short term. It's, there's not much money. Musicians are not a, a super wealthy target kind of customer base. So <laughs> yeah, kind of uh, made some of those realizations along the way. 
So we'll circle back to that because obviously a lot of that has come now into play into what you're doing with the podcasting space. But it really piqued my curiosity with your Wildman <laughs> adventures. Oh, yeah. at, so can you talk a little bit about what that job was? And I don't know if the, the description does it justice, but I'd, I'd rather hear it from you firsthand. Okay. So yeah, this was actually, yeah, I, funny. I think on LinkedIn, I was like, what do I call this job title? And so essentially it was tree planter, but I think I like put it as like wild man or wilderness man or something like that. And so I don't think this does exist in the States, but it's more of a Canadian profession, I think. And it's probably more in the Pacific Northwest, if at all in the States. And so essentially it's part of the the, the lumber industry and, you know, they go clear cut forests and then tree planters are hired to go reforest uh, those plots essentially and so it's it's almost like you can think about it like farming essentially except on a really long like 40 or 80 year time scale kind of these trees grow and then they get harvested and then people come in and plant again and so essentially these are the trees that you're planting a lot of people think they're like like you would in a residential neighborhood they're like big trees but these are all like six inch tiny little spruce and fir trees and so you are planting like if you're decent maybe like two thousand a day and if you're really good like well wow. 5,000 or if you're like a legend like six or seven thousand a day and so it's a super like monotonous physical like just wears your body down kind of job where if you do that for I mean even one summer a lot of people end up with injuries usually if you do it usually more than three seasons and you're kind of like probably going to have lasting injuries I did it for two so kind of escaped unscathed but uh, you're also out living in the forest of northern Canada in a tent for three months at a time. There's getting eaten alive by mosquitoes and black flies <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And it's one of those things that you just like hate it and complain about it in the moment. It's a good way to make quite a bit of money if you're good at it when you're like in college or whatever. And then afterwards you get out of it and you're like, that was the best experience of my life. Like, I, I, th I think I should do it again for a summer almost. <laughs> <laughs> and so is there any mechanical assistance with this? Are you literally on your knees, like just planning trees as you go so it's essentially you're not on your knees there's no mechanical assistance you have like a shovel and it's like a one-handed shovel so you essentially like kind of throw the shovel into the ground you still keep your hand on it and you just like pull it back put the tree down in that hole and then kick it shut and so oh. it all be kind of comes with this one fluid motion and so you're planting a tree probably every like three or four seconds or something like that wow and you're just like kind of going along a line up and down and back and forth and uh yeah so that's kind of how it works do they have the lines just like mapped out already you just kind of figured it you're eyeballing this no it's, <laughs> you're eyeballing it and so that's because they, there's like a target density you need to have with and they they check them like the foresters come and check it and if you are too many trees or too few trees then you have to go back and you, you replant it it's called and you have to either pull trees or add more if they were like sloppily put in you have to fix them and so you're kind of like having to eyeball like your previous line of trees which early in the season it's really easy because there's no other greenery around but then you get into july and everything's green everywhere and you're trying to spot these little six inch trees poking out and then it can get pretty challenging <laughs> And have you, this is a weird question, but have you ever gone back to visit your early plants? Like you the stuff you planted early just to kind of see if it would have uh, took off or something like that? I think in my second season, there was a similar area where it was the previous year we all recognized and we were like, oh, this, we did this last year, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's at that point, like a year in, they haven't really grown that much. I would love to go back at this point. Now it'd be eight years, maybe nine years later. So I would have no way of finding my way back or recognizing any of it, but I have always, you kind of wonder, and you, I think the stats are like 50% of the trees that are planted will die, which kind of is this, like, oh, wow. as you're doing it, you like, are just like, <laughs> oh man, all this work, it just kind of feels useless already. And then you think like 50% of these are going to die. Like, what's the point of any of this? But <laughs> yeah. So is there some sort of like camaraderie that you just kind of like happens because you're all kind of doing the same thing? You're all joined by this common ex cause and you're just like and you're spending time with the same people day in and day out? Yeah, I think it's both ends of it where like I think about it a lot. You hear about how like culture is built or teams are formed like in the Navy SEALs a lot of times of like going through something really hard. And yeah. that's the same kind of thing. And I think like so there's the the good side of it. And then there's also there's just going to be people who get on your nerves and who, <laughs> you know, just grade on you. And so you yeah, kind of yeah. have to put up with those people as well. But I would say overall, like there's, I don't have any friends I still keep in touch with, but like there are people who, there have been some times where I've like, oh, I remember this person's from this city. I'm going to be passing through. I haven't seen them in five years. And so we, you know, go get a beer and it's just like, you know, old times, like nothing's changed. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you ever had like an actual nine to five, like office job? Never an office job. I did. Okay. 
landscaping, I did construction, tree planting, I have never worked a corporate job, never worked in an office. I worked at a kitchen that was probably maybe the closest. And I did work in a warehouse one time as like a shipper receiver. And so that was maybe even the closer for a big like retail chain. So that is probably the closest I came to that. And that whatever few months that I was there was enough to make me not want to do any more of it. <laughs> Is it always been something like inherent in you, like your nature, just like this independent streak? I would say so. Like I think about going back, I think I've always, so I, I like mentioning that I've been traveling for a long time, that had always been maybe an, even an obsession to some extent. Like there was always that kind of drive to like explore, I would say. And I think that that's been like physical exploration, traveling, and then also kind of ideas wise. And so it doesn't necessarily surprise me in hindsight to see that I like didn't kind of go the typical like college corporate track. And so I think there's some kind of streak in there that yeah, I definitely kind of like follow <laughs> my own whims to some extent and find the way that way. Were your parents supportive at the time? Yeah, so my so I like, I'm really grateful for a couple of things. Like I remember my dad saying, I so I didn't go to college until I was 21 or 22 something like that so I took like three three and a half years off after high school and just like just didn't know what I wanted to do and kind of felt like well I'm not going to commit to spending time and money going to college or university until I actually know and I was kind of like looking I was like oh you know all these stupid assessments of like if you like math (laughs) maybe you'll be a good engineer and I was like well I like math and uh so I was like maybe engineering that might be something but then I like thought about I didn't really know what the job was I don't think any like 19 year old really knows what it's like to be an engineer kind of ironic that I became a recording engineer later but that just feels like an entirely different I don't think most engineers would consider that like part of their guild so (laughs) but uh yeah I just like had no clarity on that so kind of just held off and then actually got like a flyer in the mail which was for this audio school which surely they I had they'd got me from some mailing list which to me it just felt like this you know sign that like oh how did this find me and all the world how did we get delivered this like audio engineering this is like the thing and so here I was like oh this is a real job that's something that I could see myself doing so I went and did that and uh, I remember at the time when I was like going to school for that I remember my dad saying that I think he had gone to he went back to school to go to university. He'd done like cabinet making or like a trade or something like that earlier and then went back to university to get his degree when he was 30. And so he was kind of like, you know, there's lots of time. Like I'd, I changed careers when I was 30. Like you can do this and you can do it for five years. And if you don't like it, like go do something else. Well, that's cool. And uh, yeah, and my mom was like, like I think now she's like 55 in her 50s and she has just had the longest job that she's ever had, which was like three years. And so she's always been like a year and a half. She gets itchy. She like fixes all the problems in the the company that she's at and from like a bookkeeping and accounting perspective. And then it's just like boring and she needs to go find some new problem to solve and go somewhere else. And so kind of both those influences, I've always kind of like, since I've like internalized those more, I've kind of been like, okay, I don't need to commit to anything forever and I can try things out. And like when I find something, I'm going to do that, but also have the awareness that like, even when I find something I like, probably it's going to shift within a few years and there'll be something else that will open up. So it sounds like you were really supported in your upbringing by my parents who had gone, you know, not the traditional route in terms of, you know, their careers. And so I, it's nice to know that, you know, you have the freedom to try things and to go out on your own and you know, try something that may or may not work and, under- and knowing that you'll have the support of your family. Yeah. And like even from the travel side, I know a lot of people who I know who are interested in travel or do travel a lot, like face a lot of resistance from their families around that. But like my mom's parents, they have traveled super extensively and like they moved the family before my mom was born. They traveled, they lived in, moved to Africa for a year to like, my grandpa was a dentist and he was going to go practice locally in, in Africa and like as a volunteer kind of thing. And so he moved there or him and my grandma moved there with their two daughters who were like three and one or something like that. And then later when my mom was 10, I think they moved to Germany for a year and like traveled all around Europe. So like growing up and being around them, there were just always stories of like all these far off places that they went. So that was always kind of normalized in the family as well of like just, you know, going out, exploring the world. And like, I think like, Still, I think moving to Africa, I think they were in Congo. I don't know what year it was, but with two tiny kids and then like moving to Germany with three kids who are all in school age. It's just pretty out there kind of like choices as uh, mom and dad. But uh, I think that was one of the things that's just always kind of influenced maybe our family dynamics around like 
Yeah, probably, you know, all the kids, grandkids growing up listening to grandma and grandma's tales of adventure would probably inherit some of that. So when did the podcasting get on your radar? When did you start to to see what was happening in the space? Because you'd been doing the audio stuff for a while now, right? Yeah, so I went to audio school in 2011 to 2012, I think, and then discovered podcasting as a listener, I think 2014, 2015, something like that. And I had just taken a year off and had gone, just saved up and gone traveling for a year and kind of came back and was kind of like, how do I do that all the time? And I didn't realize that there like there was online business, but I did, had no idea that what to search for. I didn't know that was a thing. I'd like met a few people traveling who like owned a factory and were able to travel like full time. I was like, well, I'm I'm not going to do that. And so then I like came back and I'd heard a, a friend of mine who I'd traveled with quite a bit on that trip. He always listened to podcasts and he listened to like sports and comedy and whatever. But I was like, I came back, got a a job landscaping and could listen to music or whatever at work. And so I listened to music the first couple of days. And then I was like, ah, maybe I should like, maybe I can be more productive with the time here, you know, audiobooks or whatever. And I thought like, oh, I've heard about these podcast things. I wonder like, what is that? What exists out there? And so I like went onto iTunes at the time. And I think I searched like creative business or something like that. Cause I was like, this is probably this something around creative work. I, that's when I was getting into photography. And I was like, how could I maybe do be a travel photographer or something like that? And like, of course, even back then, search creative business and there's just like dozens of shows. And so just quickly started. I don't know if Pat Flynn's wasn't the first one I, I came Flynn, across. I was about he, to say. he was probably like the, <laughs> the second or third one I came across. But yeah. And so yeah. just started like binging that. And like literally like I was listening to probably 50 hours of podcasts a week on, you know, one and a half, two X speed. And so kind of over the course of the year, just taught myself everything I needed to know to like at least start a business, get it off the ground. And so the first <laughs> six months of that were really focused on the photography side of things. And then at some point I realized I was thinking like, oh, I'll create courses, I'll do all the stuff. And then I realized like, well, that's going to probably take me a couple of years at least to build an audience where I could sell a course sustainably. And so I thought actually probably a service-based business is way faster. If I care about traveling, I can just start getting clients today. And essentially that's what happened and realized like, oh, these audio engineering skills, it's really easy to produce podcasts if you've worked in studios before. And uh, it basically, I think after I had that realization, I got my first client within three days and within six months had enough where I was making more than the day job and was kind of off and on my way. Very cool. And so you decided early on to focus on shows that were in the the health and wellness space? So that came about it wasn't it's actually i think like most people with niching like i resisted that for a long long time sure sure yeah and it was really like one we, i met this couple at a conference it was not a pod, it wasn't really even too much of a business conference but she was a doctor and he was the operations person for the business and they actually never became clients even though they almost started a show like four times but they put me in touch with one of their friends who had a similar setup. Wife was a doctor who had like a pretty large online following and husband was the operations person and they were looking to start a show. And kind of between those two couples, they referred me to all these shows that were in the wellness space and like often very specific like women's health and wellness, like very like hormones related and around like menopause (laughs) and all this stuff. So I have learned so much more about that (laughs) world than I would have ever imagined I might. (laughs) Which is helpful. Uh, I'm sure your partner appreciates it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And if she doesn't now, she will in the future yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so what were some of the early like kind of pitfalls or stumbling blocks as you were getting started because obviously you know i always like to say you know you don't know when you're coming out of for me coming out of the nine to five because i was 20 plus years and like literally like wearing a suit to work like you know cubicle life like all the things you know and, and i had a really good job six-figure salary and stuff like that just kept moving up the ladder but then realized the set of circumstances is going to lead me to have to do my own thing. And that's why I started Podcast Junkies, did that for a year. And then probably similar to a little bit to your path, just realized, oh, all those things I know are valuable <laughs> if I can package it up. And I joined a high-end mastermind. And that's when I saw, similar to what you did, I saw all these folks with six-figure, seven-figure businesses. And I was like, I tell people it's like my digital Narnia. I was like, whoa. <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> I didn't know like these people existed they understand what an hour of their time is worth and they'd rather pay someone to do something for them that that's not their genius you know so was it sort of like a similar journey for you as well yeah i think it's interesting when i look back at especially my lack of maybe corporate career history there was i'm very aware of both the pros and cons and i think a lot of people who i've talked to like from your path you kind of get conditioned in a certain way that makes it hard to go out on your own because you've just worked so long in a, a structure 
and that like works a certain way that might not be entirely efficient or practical or you know have any reason behind it at all it's just the way things are done and you've obviously got like somebody that you're reporting to and maybe that ladder goes way way up and you just don't feel like you have any control over it so i did like didn't have any of that baggage but one of the interesting things that i always think is like i think Everybody has some kind of imposter syndrome, but I don't know that you can get to this without going through it. But like, I think I really overestimated the, I don't want to say general intelligence, but like the breadth of knowledge of my clients. And so I just assumed, especially because they're all like doctors. And so you just conditioned in in society, you think like doctors, like the smartest people out there, like doctors. And now I would think maybe more like founders and investors and like, I mean, everybody's smart in their narrow window. And given the fact that they'd all created successful businesses or successful enough to hire me and which, you know, my business isn't at the point at that stage where I can like be hiring for, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars a month people to work for me. And so I was thinking like, wow, they're like so successful in their businesses. They must know a lot about marketing and like all this stuff. And over the years I realized, Oh, like they don't really know much about any of that side of things. Like they're pretty (laughs) scrappy. Like they're really smart at their craft and which is is medicine in some way and everything else they're like really figuring out like everyone else and that took me several years to like really get through and realize like oh i'm the smart one here like i know way more about all this than all of them and i'm holding back because like i think like well what do i know like they've been doing this longer than me they figured it all out but they're more focused on another part of their business like the actual craft like so many of us are but you know, I always had that interest in business and marketing and things like that to some extent. And so it kind of took me a while to get around to that and see like, oh, actually, I have more to offer here than I'm currently like putting on display and letting them know. And that's, you know, keeping my value down to them as well, where I can't charge what I could if I was saying like, actually, I can help with all these other things too, and come on as more of like a strategist and for the show and the business and, and those types of things. And so what were some of the challenges for you early on as you were just kind of expanding your skill set as an entrepreneur? I would say, I mean, for me, it's, there's often been a kind of like, it, I, I don't know how to, what to attribute this to. There's been kind of like a stair step where it'll just be like plateaued. Like some people out here will have like really like linear growth. I've always had like a whole bunch of stuff will happen at once. And then it'll just be like nine months of like, nothing's really happening. And it's just kind of, you start to get like, luckily being in podcast production is kind of a subscription service. So unless people are really leaving, you're kind of okay at that level where the income's coming in. And so i that's just a like fluke entirely. I, you know, that's a, a great going forward. If I was to start a new business, I'd be like, yeah, that'd be great to start a subscription business because there's some security in that. But I just, you know, that's the way the podcast production industry generally works. And so kind of got lucky there. But I think like for me, because of that, I don't think I really developed a strong sales and like lead generation kind of skill set. Whereas like I'd get referrals and I mean, a lot of service-based businesses work this way. You do good work, you get referrals. And then at some point, especially like for me, when I raised prices and like doubled prices at some point, you get all these leads who no longer fit your new service offerings. And so then you kind of have to figure out like, oh, I guess I have to like actually go out and do something now. Like I can't just sit back anymore. <laughs> yeah. And so I think for me, that was a, a big to one. Listen to more podcasts. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and download all the sales podcasts now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think like in the first year, especially like I didn't, because like, especially the first year I was like, I went off, I think the two weeks after I'd gone full time on the podcast production, I was on a plane to go off traveling. And so okay. at that point, I didn't have a ton of clients. I had enough where I could like break even and save a bit of money. But I was like this, I'm living the dream, I'm traveling. And, you know, I wasn't worried about getting more clients or anything like that, working four hours a day, maybe, and then kind of came back from that trip, lost a couple of clients and kind of had this moment where I was like, oh, if I don't actually work on the business, this could all just go away. And it wouldn't, take that much. And so then I like kind of got into starting exploring content creation and all that kind of thing. And that kind of, I did that for a sprint. And looking back, I really wish I would have stuck with it. But I did like a sprint where I probably published like 40 blog posts over a year and kind of like got to the end of that and was like, well, I think I've said everything I want to say about podcasting. (laughs) This is not interesting anymore and kind of stopped writing. And then there was like a two year gap or two and a half year gap where I didn't really create a lot of content. And looking back, I'm like, oh, man, the compound effects that would have happened if I had been continually creating content for all those two and a half years, I would be I mean, I feel like I'm in a good position now, but it it would have been even better. And so that's one thing that I think, like, I think there's a phrase, I don't know if it's Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, one of them when it comes to investing is like, never interrupt the compounding. Like, that's the biggest you can mistake that you can make. Yeah. And so I think about that. And I was like, oh, I interrupted the compounding by not continuing to contribute to it there. 
Yeah, my partner is a photographer. She's been doing that for 11, 12 years. So uh, she, but she went to school for a master's in education. <laughs> she thought she was going to be a teacher. And then just she realized like that quality of life is not what she wanted. And she wanted to have the freedom to like do what she wants on her own time. And as I believe as a photographer, she did, she's done over 300 plus weddings, but then she just recently stopped. She just did the last one and she's moving into like brand photography, headshots and stuff and just kind of like capturing moments. So just sitting with the family for like an hour, you know, at the state fair and just capturing moments, which she really enjoys. But I think that discipline, she's always been adamant about like when she posts about shoots she's done in the past of weddings and she just really attributes a lot of her success as a photographer to the SEO power of these blog posts and and she's really good in terms of consistency she's always been good at she started her own podcast called photo business help she hasn't missed an episode in over you know over 300 plus episodes over two plus years <laughs> so she has that gene in there just like you know to your point like don't don't uh, interrupt the compounding so it's been helpful for her as a as a photographer now photographer podcaster to see the effects the long-term effects of being consistent now she's got sponsors on the podcast too and it's a, just a testament to just like keep doing the thing. And early on, it's hard because you're not seeing the results. You're getting, you're posting something, you're getting like one like. Or <laughs> and so, you know, what was it that brought you back or kind of made you realize that this is something that you need to, to pick back up again? Yeah. Well, so I started getting really into Seth Godin's writing, his blog and his books and all of that, probably late 2019. And he, for anyone who knows of him, is infamous for his daily blogging. So he publishes one blog post a day. And he's talked about how like he would publish more, like he just writes, you know, like a demon. And he would publish three posts a day and like has done that in the past. But eventually was like, I'm overloading people like one a day is like enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's published something like 7000 blog posts or something. Uh, most of these all consecutively in this streak. And so I'd heard him talk about this. I've heard a number of other people at this point in late 2019 talking about the benefits of writing and publishing every single day. And so going into 2020, January 1st, I decided like, okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit to publishing one blog post a day. And I remember like the first certainly month, if not two months were like, it was just, I, I, you know, set that time first thing in the morning. That was the first thing I did, made the space for it. And just some days it's a struggle. And as I got to the end of that two months, though, like it starts to get easier and you just realize I feel like that's when the benefits start showing up for a, a lot of pursuits is like, yeah, you got to get through that initial part where it is hard and you don't see any reason to keep doing it. And then something changes. And for me, a lot of it was you hear a lot of people who write regularly talk about how writing really like clarifies your own thinking. And that for me was the case where I was like, well, at this point, I don't even care if anybody ever reads anything I write. It's so valuable to me personally, just to keep writing because it's kind of like just structuring your thoughts. And so part of that was around podcasting, just because I was like, I needed ideas because I didn't have that many ideas at that time. And so like sometimes I'd write about podcasting, sometimes I'd write about marketing, sometimes I'd write about team building and like all, all this other stuff that was kind of related to business generally. And other times it would be, you know, kind of more personal stuff. And so it was kind of all over the map at first. But as especially as I started writing more about podcasting, I'd kind of like get on a, a thread and like just write a lot about that for two weeks at a time and then go on something else. But I realized as I wrote more about podcasting, then I'd get into client sales calls or consulting calls and I'd realize like, oh, I have just way more confidence. This is so much easier because I know I've already written this down. My thinking has already become like structured and I can just think back to like, oh, is there's like a pin in that idea here that I've already like fully fleshed out and articulated it in just the right way so that when now I can deliver that to someone else that's more helpful to them. And so I think at that point I was like, oh, this is like a really powerful practice. And I kind of like leaned into it more and more and more. And so now it's been, I guess we're at two and a half years that I've, I don't publish daily anymore. I guess I do publish really short form on Twitter every day, but I still write every day and publish two weekly newsletters. And then I guess I also publish a weekly thread on Twitter. And then also I publish a lot of writing <laughs> stuff. So and some of that's podcast related and some of that's more yeah. kind of creator related. How many times uh, a day are you publishing on Twitter? I do like schedule one tweet a day okay. and then I'll, you know, whatever interaction stuff like that or things off the cuff. But I feel like that's enough for me. Yeah. I think it, for me, it's of all the platforms, it feels the most natural just for, uh, I occasionally get into sprints where I, I'll do one post a day, but it feels like a stream of consciousness yeah. platform. And just like, oh, I have this thought, you know, and just like I share. And a lot of times it's, it's almost like micro blogging. It's just like, I'm not, I don't really need anyone to read it. I just needed to say it and just kind of like get it off my head. And like, yep. you know, it'll be some anything from a sentence or just a, maybe a little bit of a mini thread. But 
given you didn't actually study writing, right? No. And that's even like funny. I look back on when I mentioned like thinking about going to university, I always thought of myself as so much more of a math person. And I do love like math and data. But now I like most identify as a writer. And it's funny, I never had any I think just because like high school English class is not structured in a way that makes writing fun. Yeah, that's true. And so it's interesting, because I, I see you as a like a really good content creator. And, you know, based on what you've just shared, it's really just the function of I don't want to take it the extreme of, of like the fake it till you make it. But in, in a sense, you just have to you had to keep putting in the reps and finding your voice, essentially, in, in your, your writing style. And, you know, you probably had people you were mimicking or getting inspired from in the, in the early days. But it, is it I mean, is that basically kind of the gist of it? Just the, the idea of just putting the reps in and just figuring out like what, how and, and what you like to write about? Yeah, 100%. Like, I think I, I must have, I wonder, I probably published at least 200 or 250 blog posts before I like really and I, I look back on a lot of those and it's clear that I was like oh that was like one of mine kind of like it feels like it still holds up like I would write the same thing today and then there's a, a bunch of them probably the majority of those that I would like well, I, I would have written that differently today or or not written that at all but I think like now really I think a year into that writing habit I started my newsletter a little over a year and even that took I would say like 50 issues of even so at this point, I've been writing daily published a couple hundred posts, then starting the newsletter was a kind of different form of writing a lot of overlap. But I feel like it took me 50 issues to get clear on like what the newsletter was and get some clarity to guide myself and to like market it and craft messaging around it. Now I'm over 100 issues. I still don't quite know how to talk about it. I feel like this will just be like an ongoing life <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of my like task of pushing the boulder up the hill trying to find out how to talk about my one newsletter. But that I think that like, yeah, the getting the reps in one of my tweets that like went very micro viral in podcasting was something to the effect of like the, the first hundred reps gets you to the starting line. And I just like really feel that. And I think it's frustrating from like a consulting with brands or people who are paying you. But I feel like it almost you just read this. You talk with podcast consultants, creative consultants that like you so often maybe it doesn't get published to the public. And and even if it does, it's a lot of times it's like the second season is where you like find out like, oh, this is what we made all these mistakes in the first one. And maybe it kind of was received all right, but like we hadn't found our voice yet. And I think that's just true for anyone is like, you can create something that's good from the start, but you're probably not going to really hit your stride until you've like got the reps in, figured out the mechanics, figured out like what people resonate with, what you resonate with, where that kind of overlap is. And I think sometimes that just takes a, a lot of reps. Yeah trying to figure out how far to go down the rabbit hole of all this stuff because I'm, I'm fascinated by all this like news this wave of like newsletter economy stuff and ads and i felt like josh specter and some of these really great consistent newsletter writers and i'm always impressed by people's like ability to to continue to put out content on a consistent basis and also systems for how they plan their stuff so We'll see how far down the weeds we get, but do you have a, a system in place for in, in terms of how you plan content and how you think about where you're going to post what? Like when you write something, are you thinking that this is something gonna, that you're going to have on Twitter or this is something that's going to be for your newsletter? And then how's the ideation happen and, and how do you, you keep track of all that stuff? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this because I this has been like a recent thing that's like clicked for me kind of and I haven't like I've never written about it I haven't really talked about it too much other than just conversations with friends but like somehow to me like I'm a huge I don't know if everybody's like this but I feel like every time I get clearer on creating structure around my creative work the easier it gets to create it and I think there's a lot of like evidence around this too and of course as creatives we naturally resist this a lot of the time but for me like I remember thinking initially, even with my newsletter, like the format of it, of I share, so I write um, in my, this is my one newsletter, Creative Wayfinding. I have another newsletter, Scrappy Podcasting, but Creative Wayfinding is the one that I feel is like the most me kind of, and it's less harder to describe, more about like the internal journey of being a creator, all the stuff opposite from like the tactics and strategies and more kind of things you see on the surface level. And so part of like the structure was around like what type of essays, how long do they need to be? And that's kind of actually Now it's much more fluid, but then I also share five links in each newsletter. And so at first, just like coming up with that, that structure of like, okay, there's like one essay, then there's like five links. I think initially I had 10, but I realized that was way too many. And then there's a couple other sections around that, that just made it much easier to say like, okay, I know what I need to put in the newsletter each week. 
And then I realized later, I was like, well, actually, I want to have more structure around like, what are the links? Like the links, they feel like if I had categories for the types of links I share, that's going to bring more consistency to like the brand of the newsletter. And so I came up with like 10 or 15 categories of like, these are all things I'm vaguely interested in. Some of them are going to be creative. Some of them might be like environmental related or, you know, interesting, you know, kind of marketing or whatever. And I kind of had those. And then I kind of further narrowed that down to now there's just five consistent. There's like one thought, which is more like a thought provoking thing. Then there's a tool that I found that I find interesting. There's like a tactic. So a really like actionable thing that you can take and apply. There's something related to podcasting. And then there's kind of one wild card category that can be anything. And it's like once I came up with those, then I could start filtering these things that came into my ecosystem into like, oh, these just slot in really easily. Sure. And I, I personally know like, okay, this website, I just came across this creator, like, is this something that I would share in the newsletter? Yes, then I know like which category it goes into or no, it's cool, but it's not really a fit for the newsletter. And so that was my like first kind of like, I realized that then I was like, oh, this kind of structure and categories that makes it a lot easier to consistently create this, I put less mental energy into it. And then now recently with the writing and just the past couple months, I feel like I've always struggled with because I tend to skew to the philosophical, like higher level strategy side of things than the tactical, like, here's like five steps to do this. But I've also kind of recognized that it's a lot harder to market and sell vague philosophical things, even if there's value to it, and people like it, it's hard to like, say, subscribe to this newsletter to like achieve this result. And so I've kind of felt like, I feel like I need some content that like, is for getting people into my business as like a teacher and a course creator, like I want to be able to give people some of that in some way, but I just never want to write it. And so I realized kind of in hindsight, again, where it was like the creative wayfinding is like the most philosophical thing I write. The scrappy podcasting is much more concise and podcasting specific, still kind of not super actionable, but it's more like, here's an interesting idea to think about this week in two minutes. And then I realized like, actually Twitter is where the actionable stuff goes, where I can like in one day, just like give one little quick tip. And then on the the thread side of things is where it's like a mini blog post. And so I'll do one of those a week. And that's much more like, here's like how to actionably do this. And so it was really interesting where like I had all these ideas that I'd be just churning through ideas, writing them down. I never knew what to do with them. And then once I had this kind of structure in in place, I was kind of like, oh, this just makes it really easy. Like actionable ideas, there you go to Twitter. And then I can just decide, is that a thread or is that just a single tweet? If it's more kind of podcasting related, but more philosophical, that's going to go in the newsletter. If it's not podcasting related, more like creator focus, that's goes to my other newsletter. And so like having that in my mind, it just kind of clicked into place. And then it became very easy to understand what kind of content goes on what medium. And I think it also makes it way easier to market each of those as separate things. And you can say like, hey, if you're into this, go check, follow me on Twitter. If you're into this, go like subscribe to the newsletter. And like either one is great and they both can kind of complement each other, but not everything's going to be a fit for everyone. But the they're much more cohesive and they much more feel like packaged kind of series almost. And how do you collect the data and, you know, organize it in a way? Because I'm a big fan of like systems. I don't know if you've heard of Tiago Forte. He's got this para method, yep. which I just devoured. It took me like three or four times to just grasp what he was trying to like explain there. But that's been helpful because I, I like the idea of an offline brain because I, I too am just like a digital hoarder and just like, oh my God, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. And then I'm like, and then um, I've been understanding something like a coach said to me years ago, this idea of just in time learning versus just in case learning. Yeah. And so this idea of just like, I would just like read stuff and be like, this is cool, but I'm like, just, I don't need to read it and I could read it later. So I've been using Instapaper now to just like, you know, get stuff off, off my plate. And the interesting thing about it is I'm like, that's cool. I want to read it, but I always Instapaper it first. And then nine times out of 10, I'll go back to see it. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to read that. (laughs) Yeah. So what I'm just curious about your and what you've tried. I'm sure there's been a couple of systems you've probably tried and and then you found a solution that works for you now. Yeah, I so initially I was using mainly Pocket for like information capture, yeah. which I love everything about the app. It works really great except now I just do it all in Notion. Essentially just because it it does the same thing and I've kind of custom built that out. So like another person similar to Tiago Forte is August Bradley. I don't know if you've come across him, but he's like a Notion so, yeah. Yeah, he's Notion specific. And so he's got like one of the greatest, I mean, you have to be a really a nerd into this stuff to say what I'm about to say. But one of the greatest YouTube channels that is out there is August Bradley's. And essentially, he walks through his Notion setup. And it's kind of like similar. He's got his own, I think he calls it like the pillars, pipelines, vaults method, which is similar to para. And it's like a way of organizing and kind of 
information and also projects and goals and, you know, big, big life goals, things like that. And making sure that like from a day to day basis, all the way up to your like biggest life ambitions, like everything that you're doing, you can kind of see how it contributes to the next step up the ladder kind of. So I binged through his YouTube channel. It's essentially at this point, it's maybe getting a bit more outdated, but it's like a, like you would easily pay like a thousand dollars for that course probably on what is on his YouTube channel. He also has a course too, which I've not taken, but I imagine is fantastic. So I use that and then kind of same thing to you. Like I use the, whatever the, the web clipper Chrome extension to save articles and things like that. And they go into my notion and then I go back a week later and I'm like, oh, why did I save this? This isn't interesting at all. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Notion was one of those tools that when it first showed up, I was like, this is like, feels really cool <laughs> like like there's a lot going on here and uh, it's just it's a, the, the ability to just deep dive and just because it, it was different than Evernote because everything was living in Evernote for many years for me but there's just you couldn't it was hard to find stuff there was no way to kind of connect the dots and I think just the modular nature of Notion I don't want to get too geeky here because we're going to scare <laughs> yeah. people away but yeah I'm just I'm with you on Notion but I know there's other stuff like even bigger rabbit holes like Rome which I've heard people talk about <laughs> yeah so, I mean, I think I, I don't even want to open those cans of worms because I'm just like, ah, like, I just feel like they're just, you'll get sucked into them. I know. Watching, <laughs> you know, eight, 20 hours of YouTube videos. So, yeah. <laughs> My girlfriend, she has gone down all of those so I don't have to. Rome and Obsidian <laughs> and all of oh, them. Oh, yeah, Obsidian. That's the other one, too. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. And so then you started doing more course stuff, right? So now that's part of your, your offerings. When did you start? you know, honing that and, and figuring, like basically compiling everything that you've been learning. And when did you start to think that's something you want to start offering as well, the courses? Yeah. So I think I made like, I mean, when you came in, listening to the shows that I did when I first started out, so like Pat Flynn and, and all of those, I always, you just think so much like, oh, I got to get this like passive income. I got to make a course. And like I said, even before I got into podcasting, I was thinking about photography and starting a course. In hindsight, I realized like it took me, you know, I was probably thinking about that for almost five years before I actually created a course. And in hindsight, I was like, I couldn't have created that great a course. Like I just didn't know that much. I was not that much of an expert in anything. I didn't have practical experience. And I know you can build a successful course when you've like learned that you're that one step ahead of the person. And I just I always felt like, like, I thought about creating a podcast launch course for years, but I was like, what do I have to say that hasn't been said already? And didn't feel like there was, I was contributing anything useful. And the funny thing is like, now that there's way more launch courses, I'm actually kind of now like, oh, actually now I can actually see the, have the perspective to see what's missed in a lot of the beginner podcast launch courses. I'm still not going to do it now, but it's, so it took me a long time. So that was, I think 2019, I created kind of an internal course for our clients just on the audio production side of things. Cause I was like, I was so sick of like getting on calls with new clients, telling them how to set up their mics. And I was like, this is not the best use of my time. You can watch a video to like go through this whole process about how to record and how to like do all the technical stuff. And then we can do like one 30 minute call to like answer any questions rather than like four hour long calls, like struggling to get the mic plugged in right. And so I kind of like that I did offer it to the public, but never really had much confidence in selling it because I was kind of like, when I was creating this, was it too internally focused? Was I making references to like that you're implying that you're working with us or things like that? So I was like, eh, maybe that'll just stay as an internal thing. But I kind of learned the mechanics of producing a course with that one. And then kind of late 2019, I started getting into this, the marketing side of things with the course. And that kind of came out of doing a bunch of research kind of as a way of like keeping retaining clients because, you know, half of our clients were growing consistently. The other half were kind of just stagnant. And I was kind of like, well, I mean, the production's good on all of them. Like, what are the successful clients doing that the other ones aren't? And so just kind of got curious, started interviewing all of them, started interviewing other podcasters. And just kind of the result of those interviews was essentially a curriculum. And I kind of compiled like, okay, here's all the things successful podcasters do both to grow the show, but here's like how they've thought about constructing their shows and like how their messaging works together and like all how they build community and like all these different aspects that contribute to a successful show. And that basically just from the interviews, there was the, the curriculum. And so at that point, I've essentially through my like, I use that my like daily writing as almost like a way to explore those topics. And so in some sense, I'd kind of created the course as a bunch of blog posts, or at least a lot of the core principles. So then when I went to, you know, actually record the videos and lay out that curriculum, I was like, okay, I already know what I'm going to talk about. I've already thought through this. And so I ended up pre-selling the initial like beta version of the course in, I think, April 2020, and went through the first cohort there. And so kind of 
pre-recorded the videos, but released them on like a weekly basis. I was just kind of trying to stay one step ahead of where people were going through. And, uh, and at this point now have run five cohorts in varying formats. Some have been pure cohort based, some have been pure self paced. And now it's more of a hybrid where there is the self paced kind of foundation. And then there's also the kind of accelerator program, which is kind of really putting people's feet to the fire and going through some of the more difficult concepts around like kind of the show development process, even though these are all people who've been producing their show for at least a year. But a lot of the kind of core aspects of what makes a marketable show get skipped over in the initial kind of starting stages. And so a lot of people like have to go back and look at like, what's my positioning? What's what are my differentiation kind of strategy? And like, what makes this show interesting to someone like who am I actually trying to reach here, which of course, as you would know, as well, a lot of people don't have an answer to that, (laughs) or it's a very broad answer. And so it's kind of really going through that in a a small group of people and saying like, okay, we're going to figure out all the stuff that actually matters to marketing, so that you actually have success when we talk about like going and getting exposure and doing Doing, you know promo swaps or collabs or you know whatever it is advertising that like that stuff won't work if you haven't developed a marketable show in the first place and so that's where that that kind of accelerator comes in and um, that's where things are at with the course today that's the, is that the podcast mastery course yeah podcast marketing academy yeah part of marketing academy okay yeah we'll be sure to include links to that obviously we don't have the time to go super deep and, and i don't want to you know have even if uh, people always they are afraid of like oh if I tell everyone my stuff on the podcast no one's gonna buy my course <laughs> like that <laughs> people are lazy <laughs> like you know and I always, my coach always says you give them the what and the why for free they pay for the how so if you think about what separates a, a, a show that's consistent the quality is good they've got the audio down you know they're recording on a regular basis they're putting out episodes weekly but it's just not growing versus the folks that you work with where they've got the same stuff you know, the first group has, what are they doing differently from either a marketing perspective or a visibility or awareness perspective that separates them so they can start to see that incremental growth, you know, because obviously one of the things you talked about when you're in your Twitter threads, this idea of the different phases of the zero to 100 downloads, 100 to 1000. So, you know, just a couple of bullet points. And obviously, you know, if people want to dig in deeper, I'll definitely make sure that link to the courses and the, the show notes. But what have you found over the course of, of the years of working with folks that makes the most impact? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of like I mentioned before, the differentiation is just a huge like there are so many shows now that if you can't compellingly say why yours is I don't want to say like better in terms of quality, but like for a specific person, it helps them achieve whatever the result they're looking for is better than the other shows, then I think you're gonna have a hard time growing. And so that makes a lot more sense. I think a lot of times with educational style shows, when it comes to entertainment, that's much harder to kind of articulate why it's better. Sure. But I think a lot of times in both cases, it actually comes back to like how specific you are about the person that you're actually trying to reach. And so everybody, I'm sure, who has listened to hundreds of episodes of your shows has heard before, like, if you create a show for everybody, it's for nobody, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I think that we, d- we don't want to believe that, but it just, like, is the truth. And I think that one of, you might follow him as well, Jay Klaus. Yeah, Jay's been on the show, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's got a great podcast, great newsletter, just all this stuff is great. But he has this phrase that I used in a, a thread this week, which is kind of like, in order to stand out and grow, like you need to be meaningfully, if not uncomfortably specific about like what your show is and who it's for. Like it should feel uncomfortable for you to be that narrow. <laughs> and I think that yeah. that really is like the thing of like, people don't talk about something they you can't empower people to recommend your show to someone else if you don't know you couldn't pick out from a crowd and say like that's the exact person who should listen to my show whereas if you are clear on that then all of a sudden all your audience they're like oh other people exactly like this would love the show so when somebody like that comes across they're like oh i know the exactly the show it's made yeah, for you exactly and i think that that's just the big thing that most people don't have and so i would say differentiation is one thing and often that requires like that's not just a way to talk about your show that's a way to construct your show and so that's when i say with this accelerator program a lot of times we're taking a step back to say like we're gonna have to structure things differently and reimagine like how the show is being created so that we can talk about it in a way that's compelling it's not just coming up with like a fancy piece of copywriting that like sells the show it's like creating that show first and then the messaging's easy so that would be the one thing i would say the second thing is i think understanding like where your show actually fits in your larger like content ecosystem and 
you know, just the state of podcasting today is that it's not great at discovery. People are probably not just coming across your show. And so you need to go get out in front of your people elsewhere. And so maybe that is, there's a lot of, you know, arguments around putting your show on YouTube because that's a better discovery engine. Maybe that's like writing blog posts, which are, you know, searchable. Those are both like time intensive things that I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing. So I would just say like, go do, you know, podcast guesting, do promo swaps, just go like talk with people. And like, I think that it's such an underrated, like networking is such an underrated tool for growth, especially early on, kind of like you mentioned in that, that zero to 100 phase. Like if, when you're getting your first hundred or even first like thousand subscribers, you can probably reach all of those people like on a one-to-one basis without going for like big scalable marketing tactics. And that might take like a year or two, but I think like one of the things, and I certainly fall into this category is like people hear networking and they're like, well, I don't like that. That sounds uncomfortable. But like, I think of it as like networking with your podcast audience. It's kind of like just preemptively engaging with them. And like all podcasters want more engagement. So go like find the people and say hi and like get on a phone call with them and like DM with them. And you have this shared context already of your topic. So like, that's fun. Invite them onto your podcast. Yeah. Like (laughs) just connect with the people, go find them and don't wait for them to come to you. Go out and find them first. Like other people have built audiences around that topic. And so like, go be a part of those communities. Don't think like you need to create the community, go be a participant first for like a year or two. And then like, at some point you're going to build up that critical mass where it actually makes sense for you to say like, actually, I'm going to create my own community, like a private community of some kind, a Facebook group, a paid membership, whatever it is. But I I don't think you can like skip too many people want to skip that first step and go straight to like scalable marketing tactics. And I think that you hear a lot in like startups or anything like at the start, you just need to do things that don't scale and knowing that you're like, you're not going to do this forever, but you can't skip it at the start. And that's the part that a lot of people just, they, they shy away from. They just don't want to want to do the hard work and, or they start and then they realize how much of a slog it is. And just because, because that early feedback of like getting into groups is like, and then resisting the urge to, you know, talk about your stuff, you know, you have to add value first and people just don't have, I can tell you so many times you go in these groups and if you mention it's about podcasting, you just have this, the wave of people come in just like, listen to my show, listen to my show, listen to my show. It's just like, no one's going to listen to your show because you just blast in the feed and, you know, they eventually get kicked out of the groups. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know where that's taught that you could just go in and just drop your latest episode in like all these random Facebook groups and expect it's going to like get people interested in your show. The irony to me, though, is because I think we all want to believe like, oh, I have a great product. If I just get it in front of the right people, they're going to, you know, they're just going to come back and find it and they'll see the value in it. But most of us are not good copywriters. We're not like good at selling our shows. We don't understand how to talk about it. We're not putting it in the right place. But the, the funny thing to me is that like, I think we do that because it feels faster. It feels like, oh, this is the shortest path. Like people show that's like the shortest distance between two points. Like there it is. But the ironic thing to me is like, when we think about relationship building and like giving value first, we think like, oh, this is going to be a month's long investment. But, and I've hundred percent felt that so many times. And so I haven't done it. And then when I actually have done that approach, it's happened like within days or weeks, like it actually takes way less time of you just be like showing up and contributing to a conversation and never promoting your own stuff. I will say like, if you're going to do that, make sure your show is like easily linkable in your you know, whatever social media platform you're on. Like if your show is in your profile, everybody, you see anybody like think about this yourself. Like you go into a group or, you know, on your Twitter thread or whatever Twitter feed, you see someone with an insightful comment, you hover over their name and you're like, oh, what are they up to? And you're like, oh, they have a podcast. Interesting. And maybe you don't like subscribe the first time, but you might follow them. And then you start seeing more of their posts. And then like within a month, you're like, ah, I've been really digging this person's content. They always have interesting things to say. I should check out the podcast. Yeah. Hopefully people are taking that advice to heart because <laughs> yeah. it's the right way to do things. I want to talk a little bit about the latest course you have, which is about sponsorships. I, I signed up for that one, I'm getting value from that. So thank you. It's interesting because it's, I sort of backed into it because I have a second show called the Vertical Farming Podcast. Ah, yep. So I was in, someone gave me a book and apologies to the listener who's heard this a couple of times already, but essentially I was saying, could I create my own podcast client? And I was like, well, vertical farming is a chapter in the book, Abundance by Peter Diamandis. And I was like, oh, this is an industry that's getting a ton of funding, VC money. So I was like, I called vertical farming podcast. So very simple. It's very niche. Yeah. <laughs> like, and if you're searching for that topic, like, you know exactly what you're going to find. I have the domain. If you Google those three words, the first thing that shows up in Google. 
I made sure to just interview, focus on CEOs and founders. So when you look at the who's who, it's been 50 plus episodes. Yeah. Like it's people in the industry are like, oh yeah, I've been to a couple of podcasts, indoor farming conferences now this year. And I've had a sponsor from day one. I got my first sponsor before I even launched the show. And so I'll, I'll be talking about this at Podcast Movement on Thursday about that and just generated over 60K in revenue just from sponsorship dollars because it's so niche and it's in an industry that's got, it's got to be a combination of not only niche topic, but also an industry that has marketing dollars Yes, <laughs> and, and that's growing. And so it was just interesting how I kind of like, not exactly stumbled in it because sort of reverse engineered it. And I knew like I wanted to create something that's going to be visible. If I just started interviewing people who like vertical farming, it would have been interesting, but not as interesting as seeing like the heads of these companies being interviewed. And because I've been doing podcast junkies for six plus years at the time, I'm very comfortable with long form interviews. So I was yep. like, okay, like I know how to talk to people. I don't have to be an expert in the topic, but I have a passion for learning at the same time as my listeners learning. So I, it's been helpful because I saw a lot of, it's a lot of stuff that you talked about in the course. And it just, you know, to see that just to remind people that's a viable option. Cause I think people keep thinking that it's the CPM model. And then you do a good job of walking people through like all the options, including CPM, but then you land at the idea of like, think about how you could build a show that would be attractive to sponsors. So I'm wondering like how you got to thinking about this topic and then creating the course. Yeah, that's, it's interesting because I never really, this is really funny because I used to be super against sponsorships actually, where I was like, and because most of my clients, and this was when podcasting as a ecosystem was less developed, you know, five years ago, something sure, like that. Sure. And I always yeah. thought like, this is the stupidest way to try and make money. Like the CPM model, you need such a big audience. It just isn't realistic for most creators. And yeah. then I started seeing some of my clients and I mean, they were all business owners. And so like, if you have a product or, and especially like if it's a digital product that's scalable, like you will make way more money by creating a course and selling that and using the podcast to promote that and help people get to know, like, and trust you in the long run. And so it's just, to me, it was so clear, like that's a better business model. But then some of those clients who had successful courses or businesses, whatever, client service businesses, whatever it was, started like also getting sponsorships. And I started thinking, oh, well, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Why not? Like you've got the property there, the media platform. Like if you can get sponsorships for that too, it's free money, might as well. Yeah. And then I started talking to some clients and this was maybe like 2018, 2019, who were getting like some serious sponsorships with small shows. And so I think I shared two examples in the course where my one client, he had a show that was maybe like 1, 1,500 downloads an episode. And at one point he had two sponsors each paying $3,000 a month. And one of them was, I think, on like a year long contract. And the other one was maybe three to six months or something like that. And so that is just like absurd. If you look at the comparative CPM models, it's like 25 or 40 times or so, like something <laughs> like that, whatever the CPM yeah. is. And you think like, how can this be possible? And like the answer is going back to that, like meaningfully and maybe even uncomfortably specific audience is that like, if you are that narrow, there are other companies out there serving that same really narrow audience. And you might be the only option to advertise to get in front of that audience. And if you're like one of three podcasts or one of one who serves that audience and has that relationship with them, if there's a company out there who also wants to get in front of that audience, you have a monopoly on it or a near monopoly, depending on how many shows there are. And so you can command really high rates and probably they're still getting more benefit and value out of that than going through Facebook or other kind of advertising oh, yeah. platforms a lot of times. And so I think like there is a lot of nuance where you can go really narrow in a niche that doesn't have any money, kind of like you mentioned. And so it's not like it always works that way, but for many, many audiences, many niches, I think like the narrower you go, the actually, the more you can potentially charge sponsors, which people don't really think about it that way. And the broader you go, then you just have to compete on a CPM model, which then you have to build tens or hundreds of thousands of people onto your audience, which is not easy to do. Yeah. And I think it's also that other aspect of being niche, but being in an industry that where there's money <laughs> because yep. you could be knitting Dungeons and Dragons coasters or something like that. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to get sponsors for that at super niche, but I think, I mean, or have a podcast about that, but I think, yeah, I think it's a, just a reminder to be looking out. And there's always like, if you just follow like future trend stuff, there's always these new industries. Like I just kind of like back my way into vertical farming, which is huge, but alternative plant, I mean, uh, plant-based meat stuff, right. cellular, cellular proteins. I've been like, Whoa, this is like, this is one of those, a lot of money, a lot of investing, fast growth, you know, so I was just, I'm always thinking about replicating that. But I think what's been fascinating is just this, my visibility and quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes here for the listener, thought leadership in the vertical yeah. farming space, because now people are like, 
oh, I was looking for a job in vertical farming. So I grabbed verticalfarmingjobs.com. I grabbed verticalfarmingweekly.com. Yep. And it's just interesting how I'm just building up this like subject matter expertise. And I'm learning at the same time. But it's just a reminder to how quickly you can be seen as just like a little bit of an expert in the space by virtue of you surrounding yourself with the intelligent people who are having conversations on a topic. Yeah. And I think like one thing to keep in mind is because I feel like people there might be push back and be like, well, that's nice because you're interested in that. But like, I don't, my, I'm interested in this thing. And that's what I want to podcast about. But I think like, there's always like, I feel like even podcasting for me feels like I'm not going to do be it talking about podcasting when I'm 60. I mean, I hope not. I mean, maybe there's a chance I don't assume the technology will be anything what it is today. You'll have a podcasting for 60 year olds. Course. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I think a lot of things and like photography, like in my past as well, there's like all these things like you do the one thing and actually podcasting at the start when I got into it, I was like, well, this will allow me to bring in some money while I work on building up the photography business. Sure. And so I think sometimes it's like, hey, I like the medium of podcasting. And I want to be known for this topic. Like, this is the thing I really love talking about. But maybe I could do a podcast on something else. And just it's kind of it would be better working than working my day job. So maybe for now, I'm going to do two podcasts. This one is just to like build a business around it and test out some things. I can kind of reverse engineer this, say that this is an emerging industry and there's funding to it. And so I do that. I can become kind of known in that space. And then over time, maybe that opens up other opportunities for my other show. And like that's happened for one of my editors who worked with me for a long time. He worked at this show that uh, it's about like pop punk kind of stuff, lifestyle. And the show's called Reminiscent. His name is Tom Kelly. He does a bunch of, uh, people might know him if you are on YouTube and Clean Cut Audio is I think his channel. So he okay. does tons of awesome stuff. But he has the show Reminiscent that 200 downloads an episode, something like that, not a big audience at all. But the right people saw it and he got all these like job offers from the biggest people in like the punk industry, which is like... Wow. It's kind of crazy how some of that stuff happens. He'd been producing the show for maybe five years, but it was just that thing he did with his best friend from high school where they like talked about like, becoming dads while still being like obsessed with pop punk and like all the stuff. He's got a huge mohawk and yeah, just like they're kind of characters and it's a fun show. Yeah. Never had a big audience, but still opened up all these possibilities. And so sometimes like that small show is like the passion project. You never know where that's going to lead, but you can also take those other skills. He did more practical things like building this YouTube audience around podcasts, like specifically deep dive technical audio stuff and like everything kind of just ends up funneling into each other the more kind of projects you start and, and keep with yeah so what's next for you like what just maybe it's so hard to especially in this day and age you know you know what yeah. the hell is going to be <laughs> happening and you know, all the people who are making plans in february of 2020 were just like yeah this is what my next year is yeah. gonna be like <laughs> so what just like maybe just 12 months out like you just feel like the path you're on is keeping you happy and keeping you engaged yeah it's Funny, I've been having this conversation multiple times this week where it's kind of a weird thing. I think like so often we, I think a lot of marketing does this, which is the kind of marketing I hate and like certainly don't teach, makes you like feel where you're lacking in some sense. And so there's always that like, if I just had that like one thing, I'd be happy or like I'm missing this piece of knowledge. Yeah. And I kind of feel like for the first time in a long time, like, oh, I feel like I'm doing all the right things and I just need to like keep getting the reps in and like all the audience is growing and like the course keeps doing better each launch. I'm like, okay, everything's trending in the right direction and I don't feel like there's some missing piece of knowledge or missing practice, like keep writing, keep creating content, keep doing podcast interviews like this, like being helpful to people. So I like really feel like from a day-to-day -day practice, like things are going in the right direction. And so then it kind of feels like where do you funnel that momentum maybe? And so like right now, I still have the production agency. That's kind of something I'm looking at phasing out at some point. It's not really where my excitement or energy is. And so really, it's on the podcast marketing academy side of things. And the goal around that, the bigger vision is really to build like the kind of go to place for like podcast marketing and growth education. And so some of those will be courses taught by me. But then one of the things I'm looking at is bringing in a lot more people to contribute courses to those in very specific narrow subject matters where they're like real experts had real results and kind of creating that ecosystem. And so kind of the creator vertical is the first one we're building out. But over time, there's going to be then the like corporate and network vertical and the marketing, how that applies in those environments. And then one of the other things is looking at training people to become marketers in the podcast industry, which is there's just a huge, like if anybody wants to earn like a six figure salary and is in interested in podcasting, like learn marketing and you can get that job Absolutely. like next month. 
So Absolutely. feel free to come take the course if that's you. It's not 100% targeted to that, but that's one of the things that, it, that we're looking at building out a course that is specifically looking at like taking people who have an understanding of podcasting and teaching them all the marketing skills that they need to like go work for a network or a production studio or something like that and be well equipped to, to do so. Yeah, because there's a lot of things like even myself, like I don't do everything I could be doing for my shows. And you think about like even the shows we produce for our clients, like there's a lot of the low hanging fruit that you can do submit to like a podcast directory, you know, submit to the podcast apps, do promo swaps. And then you start to stair step your way to like gumball and like all podcorn type yep. stuff. And But it's you need a methodical. I mean, for me, I think you just need to know what's working, what's not like Tanner's dollar a day, right. Facebook yep. ad campaign stuff. Like th these are things that I could see working, but for me, because I come from like a marketing and a reporting background, like I managed a reporting team and I was a e trade like, and the whole maximum what gets measured gets managed, right? Like what's the baseline? What are we trying? We tried for 30 days. Did it move the needle? Cause people tried everything and they don't know which one of those things helped. So I think that that's part of my challenge. Just like, I don't have the time. I think if I just started into podcasting now, I'd probably go that route or the marketing stuff, which yeah. I love. It's a challenge for people because there's so many things to do and try and there's no disciplined approach. And so hopefully maybe this, I don't know if this is stuff you'll be covering in the course, but there's just like, there is a, do this before you do this aspect of something. Yeah, as well. certainly. And again, the last thing I would just say on that is like, really, the first thing to do is like, make sure you've got a show that when you tell your ideal listeners about it, their eyes light up and they're like, oh, this is the show I've been waiting for. And if you're not getting that, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you can get in front of a million people and you're not going to get many of them back. So. Yeah. Did you read uh, Eric Newsom's book? Yes, I did. Love that. Yeah, it's yeah. a good one. It's one of the better books. There's so many books about podcasting. They all just rehash the same stuff. But that was the one of the first ones where I was like, well, this is, I mean, and obviously with his background at Audible and stuff like that, like he's, he knows, you can, it's clear that like he's, you know, above the rest in terms yeah. of like actionable, real world stuff that you can use. And so I use a lot of the, it's talked about in that book yep, as well. Yeah, me as well. A couple of questions as we wrap up. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Recently? Okay, this is actually, this is last week. So very recently. And I can actually think of two things, but I'm going to go for the first one that was the bigger brainwave. So I have been feeling recently like I have been on like tons of calls, just living in like calls and inbox have been just like where all my time is going. And it's been really frustrating yeah. as a creative person where I feel like, ah, I have all these projects I want to make progress on. And I just feel like admin is eating away at my whole day. And yeah, <laughs> I realized that like, and then at the same time, though, I was, this was actually a realization. I was on a call with a friend and I was First, I was telling her, I was complaining about how I was just stuck in all these admin type tasks. And then the next sentence, I said like, yeah, but like, here's all this great stuff that's happened, all this progress that's been made in the past week or two since we chatted. And I like, my brain was like, wait a minute, those two things, like you keep saying like, you don't have time to make progress on anything, but all this progress has happened. So like doing creative things, like that was the measure of me making progress forward of like building things and creating podcasts and newsletters and courses and all that kind of stuff. And what I realized was like, oh, maybe I've reached a different phase of the business and my like creative practice where maybe progress is actually measured in connections and getting on calls and being in my inbox and emailing people and like coordinating things. And that was kind of like such a mindset shift where I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I've built all the assets I need to build for now. And now it's about like growing the network and just like connecting with more people. And so that has been one that was just kind of a, like out of left field and kind of like hit me like a freight train and was like, oh, yeah, maybe I am making a lot of progress. And it's just like, I need to shift my measurement of it. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, because I think where I lacked in terms of like the consistent uh, content creation, what's always felt natural for me is networking. Just like just building relationships, yeah. connecting with people yep. on LinkedIn mainly and just saying like, oh, let's have it, you know, and just opening like ability. To, I was using this app called Lunch Club for a while. I did that through the pandemic for like, I think I did every week I had at least three calls. I did it for like almost a year. And I was just like having them, you just telling people what it is you do. And then it's interesting to see how that's, it's a long tail effect and like, you just never know. You can't piece the threads together about which connection to which person because of which conversation will lead to like yep. either becoming a client or deciding to work with you. And I think that's been something for me that's been really eye opening. Just the ability, just almost like planting seeds of just like helping people and then like jumping on. If we, hey, you're starting a show, like happy to. If it comes yeah. to a referral, yep. I'll just do it as a free thirty minute chat, just like to help people. I always feel like I was there's an aspect to my business that I always <laughs> want to be giving back. Uh, most a lot of misunderstood. Me Let's see. Started as well. Where to go with that What's one? What's the most misunderstood thing about you? 
There may, well, I wonder about this. So it could be, I talked with somebody at a conference a few weeks ago who he knew me through Twitter and he was very surprised when we talked in person. He was like, oh man, just like based on your Twitter profile, I feel like you're just like this podcast guy. Like that's all you care about and all you do. And when I talk with you on, and he's like, honestly, like I wouldn't have followed you on Twitter because I'm just like, I have a podcast, but I don't really want to, I don't care to talk about podcasting. But now when we talk here, I realize like we really think about all the same things and are like, and so I was like, that's really interesting. And that's partly, and sure, that is sure. an intentional choice to like niche down on Twitter because my business is centered around podcasting. But part of me, it kind of like kills me a little bit to be there's all these things. And that's, again, going back to that idea of having different venues and different kind of mediums for different topics where like my creative wayfinding newsletter, that was the thing that him and I really connected over that we he writes a newsletter as well. That's very much in the same world. And he was like, yeah, it kind of like I wouldn't have followed you on Twitter, but now I'm so glad we've met and I'm so glad to subscribe to your newsletter. And so I feel mm -hmm. like depending on what context you know me in, you might think of me as like just a podcasting guy when like there's all this other stuff that I care about just as much. And depending if you're like come from that world, I sometimes wonder about people who come in through that door. Do they like realize that I like teach podcast marketing stuff? Like am I do a good enough job like cross pollinating for it? Because there is a significant overlap in the middle. Yeah. And it's, I mean, anyone who's I think just creative by nature and had as varied upbringing as you have like you have a lot of things that light you up and a lot of things you're passionate about so it's hard to pigeonhole i'm the same right. way like i grew up djing like i love house music like that was my first passion that's what led me to podcasting and that's and i have it i'm it, and i'm known as the podcast guy <laughs> so but it's strange it's like i don't like to be pigeonholed either and then i started the vertical farming thing so now i create and talking about notion i created a page called hd bio if you go to my full cast site yeah it's a link to there and redirects and it's just like anytime <laughs> yes. i start a new project like my soundcloud page is there like this random newsletter that has like 25 subscribers where i'm yeah. like, talking about like <laughs> metaphysical stuff like yeah you can go you want to chase me down that rabbit hole go for it because it gets pretty <laughs> crazy but you got to find it you got to go look for it you know it's not easy to find but for the people who are interested but then it's like yeah. Jenkins, i can find something to line up with like, that yeah like i'm doing all these things and it's, so it's hard to when people are like what do you do i'm just like what are you interested in and <laughs> what rabbit hole you want to go down so well jeremy i, I really am glad uh, we finally connected after just running in, in the same circles for a while are you going to be at the podcast movement i certainly will be yes cool so we'll have to hang out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get connected. And uh, I'm glad uh, we got to chat and just get to know a little bit more about you. I, I always feel like this format is just the best way for me. Just like, because we could talk at the conference, but I already know from experience, like we're going to see each other in the hallway or it's going to be like five minutes or we'll be at a bar and we'll be like probably already three beers in already. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I've learned my lesson. I'm just like, let's have a focused conversation. So at least we had that connection, which is why I'm always grateful for these opportunities. Yeah, I love that. And yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This has been fantastic. Yeah. What is the best place for folks to get to connect with you? So I've created a page with all my links. So you can go to counterweightcreative.co slash junkies. And okay. that is counterweightcreative.co slash junkies. And you can find all the links to all my stuff there. Best place other than that is Twitter. And I'm at I am Jeremy Enns. And that's where I'm most active on social media on a regular basis. Spoken like a true podcaster, very well prepared with his link for the host. Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, thanks again. I really appreciate your time, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks again to Jeremy for coming on the show. Always appreciated. I'm looking forward to partnering with him on his upcoming podcast, Marking Academy. So make sure if you are not on my email list, the quickest way to do that is just to download the slides from the conference. That way you can get on my email list and I'll let you know what's coming up. We're partnering on a great marketing course he's offering. So make sure you listen out for that. Fullcast.co forward slash PM22. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. CedarSoil.com for his great collection of music. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Focusrite, and their awesome line of gear, specifically their Vocaster line. Learn more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Vocaster. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. To learn more, visit fullcast.co to see if we're a fit for you. If you've made it this far, you're no doubt looking for this week's retention hashtag. Let's go with twitter jeremy just because of this killer twitter game <laughs> and make sure to tag us at podcast underscore junkies and jeremy and i am jeremy ends thank you for all you do to support the show i'm so happy to be back in the saddle tune in next week for my conversation with anna deshawn who i also got to meet in podcast movement she's awesome you're gonna love that one <laughs>